raindrops are falling on my head And just like the guy whose feet are too big for his bed Nothing seems to fit Those raindrops are falling on my head And they keep falling Stop the rain by complaining Because I'm free Nothing's worrying me How many of you ever felt that way? That raindrops keep falling on my head. God, how much more can I take? Have you been through that in your life where you're like, hey, things are going pretty good, and all of a sudden there's more comes on you, more comes on you, more comes on you, and the next thing you know... It's like we have a, one of those little inflatable pools in our backyard, you know, with the little chlorination. It was raining and raining, and the thing just spilled over and it went all through our, our backyard. And sometimes that's kind of how it feels like in our lives, where we just keep getting rained upon, and things keep going on, and maybe you lost your job, and you try to get another job, you lost that one, or maybe there's a situation where you're just trying to, you're trying to restore your family. Maybe your kids are wayward, and you're like, okay, I'm going to try real hard, and you try hard, and it gets worse. Have you ever happened to you? And we're like, all right, I know what I need to do. We need to move and go to a new area. And you move to the same area, and it's, it's worse. You move someplace else. I don't know if you've ever experienced that in your life. I know I have. And I, I prayed some dangerous prayers, by the way. I said, God, help me to grow. Give me patience and grace. <laughs> by the way, never pray for patience. If you pray for patience, something bad will happen. No, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> and so I don't know about you, but there's been times where I've been overwhelmed. I'm like, God, I just don't like this. This is, this is really tough. I got a lot of pressure on me. I got, I'm feeling this way. And maybe, have you ever experienced this? You want to get close to God, and it's like you try to read your Bible, and you can't, and you feel like you're a failure. You come to church, you see everyone worshiping God, and, and you can barely do it. Or maybe you see people, you're sitting there, or maybe you're single, and you're sitting there by yourself, and everyone's in love. I mean, everyone, so everyone you turn your head, people are smiling. It's like, and they're in slow motion to make it worse. They're like... <laughs> I remember when I was a young man after breaking up a relationship, I remember going to church. It was perhaps the worst, the, I, it was the worst thing I did all week in regards to feeling like what a fair I was in my relationship. I mean, if everyone was in love, everyone was doing, having a good time, and, and uh, maybe you've experienced that, or maybe, you know, your, your children, you, you just, you bring them to church and you're kind of embarrassed because they're not behaving very well. Uh, has this ever happened to anybody uh, where you just, you know what, we're going to go to church today. We're going to do it. And you make sure the children are in bed. You put them in bed early. And you, you think you're going to get there in time. And you're not. And then you're going to you get in the garage. And they, they're running late. And then Junior slaps Susie, slaps Johnny. And you're driving the car. You're here. And all of a sudden, your, your wife says to you, will you please take care of those kids? You're like, okay, I will. And then you take care of the kids, but you overdo it. And then your wife's upset with you for overdoing it. And then you're upset with your wife for being upset with you to correct the kids because she told you to do it the first time. Then she's upset you're doing it. And then you say, hey, how dare you do that? And then she says, how dare you do it to that? And the kids say, mom and dad, stop arguing. I'm getting anxious. And the next thing you know, you come into church, and you're all upset, and you're like, we're not going to go to church today. And so you turn around, you go back home. That's never happened to anybody, has it? Okay. Well, listen, all of us at times can be overwhelmed. And, you know, I wish I could say, come to Jesus Christ, give your life to him, and you're going to have no more problems. No more problems. Everything's going to be beautiful. Everything's going to be wonderful. Just repeat after me, Lord Jesus, come to my heart, and just give the sinner's prayer. And, and I wish it was that way, but it's not. You know, Jesus makes us a promise, by the way. I don't know if you realize this. He, he gives us a promise, and it's a great promise. He says, in this world... That's what he says. This gives us a promise. And this is something you want to put in your dashboard. In this world, he says, you will have, ex you will have an easy life once you give your life to me. He doesn't say that. If you want to throw it up there, Oz, uh, please. If you could, I'm sorry to have my screen today. Next week we'll have the screen back. Um, but um, he says, in this world, you will have trouble. That's found in John 16, 33. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. So I'm going to let you know something here. In this world, you're going to have trouble. Okay? It's going to happen. In fact, if you try not to have trouble, you'll have more trouble. 
Well, let me explain. We, we, we had a situation about a year and a half ago where we had these, I don't know what they were, possum, groundhogs. I don't know. It was like Caddyshack. I don't know what was going on. But we had these things popping up in the backyard and, you know, and, you know like, what's going on? These little holes and tunnels in our grass. And I felt like Elmer Fudd without a rifle and, uh, or a shotgun. And then I called our dear friend Chet Lachowski, set some traps up, and we caught a little family of these things. And then we got rid of them. I was like, oh, thank goodness it's over with. Well, about a week later, Ralph and I are laying in bed. It's in the morning. And this putrid smell, I mean, it was awful. It, I felt like I was driving through New Jersey at the refineries <laughs> in 95. And lo and behold, we had a family of skunks living under our deck. And we couldn't get rid of the darn things, right? I didn't know how to get rid of them. And so here you are trying to get rid of the moles or whatever they were, groundhogs, and you're trying to get rid of the problem, and a worse problem happens. Have you ever happened to your life? Well, you're trying to get rid of this problem. Okay, I'm gonna, things are going to get better. I'm going to try to, okay, I'm going to try to be at peace with my boss. Okay, from now on, when I go to work, I'm going to be extra careful. I'm going to get there early and stay late, and then lo and behold, something happens. Or you, you say to yourself, you know what? From now on, I'm not going to be upset with the children anymore. I'm, I'm putting it, Jesus is my strength. I'm going to do well. You hear a nice sermon in church. You go home. You come to the altar. You cry. You're, you're, singing, you know, you're singing praise and worship cars, songs in the car, and you're just all, you know, feelings, nothing more. You're all emotional. You go home. You feel like a great woman or man of God. You come home, and you're doing well for about five minutes, and then you blow it again. Or how about you say to yourself, you know what? No more in debt. That's not going to happen anymore. We're going we're gonna to start saving and taking care of ourselves. You stop by the Ford dealership. You see a Mustang GT. You cash in your 401k and you buy it. <laughs> That's never happened to anyone, has it? But, you know, we go through these situations. You want to get better. You want to do better. You want the church to do well. I mean, I go through this too. And then it seems like it gets worse. And then more stuff happens. And then more stuff happens. And it seems you get hit at many different avenues. And you're like, God... Where are you, God? I'm overwhelmed. Where's this peace like a river thing? What's about God is with you and never leave you? Where is that? I don't see that. My father, who was here several weeks ago, if you remember, he was speaking here. He did something as a child. And uh, they, were, they had these little chicks, not girls, chicks, chickens, chicks, okay? Literally chicks. And so they had these eggs, and they were watching them hatch. And my father felt bad. He said, I need to help this little chick out. So he got a little pencil, he was tapping on the egg, and he broke the thing out, thinking he'd help the little chickadee. And unfortunately, it was like this. Go ahead. The first service, it was unbelievable. They all went, oh. I said, what did you have for breakfast this morning? Eggs? How dare you say that? <laughs> but my father tried to help this little chick out, and as a result of breaking that egg for the chick, it, had a, it, had a, it was mal, malformed. You know, the truth of the matter is sometimes we, we rebuke the devil. Sometimes it's God wanting us to grow up. You know, it was a period of my time I, I wanted to bring you, your attention to something. When I was growing up uh, in your young 20s, and uh, there was a time where I felt like God just left. And uh, before, I used to pray, read my Bible, I used to sense his presence, and go to church, get something out of it. And all of a sudden, for about a year, I get nothing out of anything. Read the Bible, got nothing out of it. Prayed. I prayed for help. <laughs> Worst things happened. Pray for joy. I had more misery. You know, it was just amazing. It was an amazing thing, but I knew that God was trying to get me to break that egg to go to another level in Him. Sometimes God will allow you to go through difficulties. But I wanted just to share with you this morning something that Jesus did. And Jesus says, You want to open your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. I'm going to read from two versions today, primarily the New Living Translation and the New King James Version. You can follow along on the screen as well. And this is what Jesus has to say. Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. So Jesus says, come to me, come to me. So what do you do when something bad happens? How do you handle it? Well, Jesus says a promise. He says, come to me. He says, come to me. So if you have burdens, come to Jesus. That's what he asks you to do. 
Well, how is that supposed to happen? I, I, I don't understand. How am I supposed to come to Christ if something bad happens? People say, just let go and let God. I mean, you've heard, heard that before. How many has that helped you? Brother, just let go and let God. What is that supposed to mean? How am I supposed to let go and let God? Or you're going through a deprime, or maybe you're going through depression or something. Someone says, just put a praise and worship CD in. Or just put on K-Love. It will all be better. You're like, be quiet. You ever go through those times where everyone gives these quick little answers and it's not coming so quick? Well, how do we handle these difficulties in our lives when they come? Because Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. If you could put that up again, please, I'd appreciate it. John 16, 33 says this. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart or encourage your heart, for I have overcome the world. So the first thing we got to first, if you're going to get free of being overwhelmed, stop trying to get rid of problems. Because you know what? Life is one big problem after another. Isn't that encouraging? Put that on a bumper sticker and drive around with that on there. <laughs> Life is one problem after another. But you know what? Problems give us solutions. Life is full of problems. This is not heaven. The Bible says all creation groans for its redemption. You're going to have problems. You're going to get a flat. You're going to, you might lose your job. Who knows? Things happen. The situation is not what happens to you. It's what happens inside of you that makes all the difference in the world. So Jesus says you're going to have trouble in this world. And when Jesus says you're going to have trouble, guess what? You're going to have trouble. You're going to have trouble in this world. But take heart, he says, for I have overcome the world. How do you overcome with Jesus? Well, it says in verse 28 of Matthew 11. Matthew 11, 28 says this. It says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened. Okay? Come to him. Why? You know, why, what does it mean, come to him? Let me explain to you. We just talked about in this world you'll have trouble, right? Fear not, I'm with you, God says. But do you realize when Jesus said the fear not and all that, have no fear, do you realize that Jesus went through fear? Yeah, that's right, he did. Do you realize that Jesus was overwhelmed? Yeah, he was. Jesus says, my, my soul is at the point of death, he says. When he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was going through a difficult time. He understands that. Father, if you're able to remove this from me, he was deep in anguish. So Jesus was overwhelmed. So do yourself a favor, please. Would you cut yourself some slack for being overwhelmed? It's okay if you're overwhelmed. It's okay if you're stressed out. It's okay if you feel like giving up. That's all right. That's going to happen to everybody. Jesus understands that. So... Stop attacking yourself. Cut yourself some slack. Jesus says this in verse 28. He says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened. You know, what's interesting is when we're weary and burdened, who do you go to first? Who do you go to first? When something good happens, you get a pay raise or, or something like that, who do you go to first? When something bad happens, who do you go to first? What's first? What's first in your life is what you thirst the most. What's first in your life is what you thirst the most. So if the first thing you want to do when you hear good news is go on Facebook, so everyone else you can do a little selfie. Can you please tell me, why, what's the deal with the... I, I don't understand. I have a little secret for you guys, okay? I learned something. I started doing selfies looking, from looking down up. It shows this. What you got to do is you got to go higher like that. Okay. <laughs> but what's the deal with that, right? Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to swear. Or the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to call X, Y, and Z with this person. The first thing I'm going to do when I'm stressed out, I'm going to run and I'm going to go to the bar. I'm going uh, to have a martini to take the edge off. Or I'm gonna go to this, I'm gonna go to the doctor. I mean, listen, there's nothing wrong with, with going to the doctor. There's nothing wrong with calling a friend, but there is a problem if that's the first place you go to. Jesus says, seek what? First, what? The kingdom of God. And so Jesus says, come to me. But we often go to other people first. 
Let me go to, I mean, even, even coming to your pastor or your friend, let me go to my wife first. No, I should go to God first. Because what you go to first is what you thirst the most. And there is a biblical order in, in Scripture. Whatever you give first, God will bless. Seek first the kingdom of God. And then all of these things. It doesn't say try everything else first. And then if nothing else works, then go to church or, or then go to God. It says seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added. Don't worry about tomorrow. So my friends, one of the ways we deal with being overwhelmed is first go to God. Don't go to Facebook first. Don't go to church first. Don't go to your, no, your friend first. Don't go to swearing first. Don't go to smoking pot first. Don't go to drinking first. Don't go to moaning and bemoaning first. Go to God first and say, God, read the Psalms. My heart is overwhelmed, God. Tell God, God, you know what? I'm ticked off. I'm upset. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened. When you're heavy burdened, you're, you're carrying this thing up in your back, and you ever feel that way? You almost feel, you ever get to the point in your life where you're a bit claustrophobic? It's like the whole world's pressing in on you. And then all of a sudden, you're being pressed in upon, and all of a sudden, you start saying things and doing things you're ashamed of. Oh, I don't know where that came from. You know where it came from? In your heart. And so, just last week, I was preaching on the fruit of the Spirit, and then I had plenty of opportunity, by the way, to exercise that fruit. Plenty of opportunity trying to get home for my daughter's birthday party, and the flights are canceled. It's a beautiful day. There's sunshine outside, and they canceled the flight. I'm like, okay, cool. We'll go, we'll go tomorrow. Drive two and a half hours to another airport with Kevin, right? We wait again. They cancel our flight again. I had two hours of sleep, <laughs> okay? And all of a sudden, and Kevin's there. I'm so glad Kevin was there because I behaved myself really, really well. But, you know, you get this pressure and this stuff comes out of you. And you know what? I'm like, thank you, God, because I have an opportunity now to deal with an issue in my life I want to give to you. But he says, come to me, all those who are heavy, laden, and burdened. And sometimes we're overwhelmed with guilt. Maybe a habitual sin you can't get over with or can't get right with God or whatever it is. Uh, uh, overwhelmed with bills, overwhelmed with thrills. I don't know. He says, come to me. Verse 28, all of you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will take it all away, and all your problems will go away, and you'll have a good time at church. Is that what it says? Don't you, if you hear anyone preach that way, I have. I've probably done it myself. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Do you realize rest is not a, not a situation, it's a place inside? Do you realize you can be at rest inside even though everything is, is chaotic? You can. So, you see, the problem with you and I is we often try to exchange the exterior sets of circumstances instead of dealing with the internal sets of circumstances. You see, when you change what's in here, what happens here changes. But we often try to change here. I, I know what I need to do. I need to move to Florida. I need to move to South Carolina. The taxes are cheaper. Then we'll be happy. Then, I'll, then we'll do good. If I get a girlfriend or a boyfriend, if I, if I do this, if I had this job, then I'll be all right. If she would just stop nagging me, if he would just get off the couch, if, if, if the kids would just clean, if we have all these conditions, then I will be. Do you know what happens when you do that? You know what you're doing? You're giving people power to control you. You're saying to your kids, it's up to you that I'm happy. You're saying to your boss, you have control of my happiness. That's crazy. Why on earth do you want to give power to so many people? Take it back and realize something here. You know what? The peace and rest is going to have to come from God inside of me, not other people. Circumstances do not do that. It's what's inside that matters the most. Bible says what? Come to me first. Come to me, all those who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It doesn't say I will not give you rest. It says I will give you rest. I will give you rest. How many of you can use some rest? How about you can't sleep at night? Has it ever happened to you? I was doing right, well one night. I had a stressful thing going on. I was sleeping really well. All of a sudden, Matthew gets up in the middle of the night. We have three bathrooms in the house. But he comes in our bedroom and wakes us up, which, you know, this is fine. And then my mind started thinking. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? And I'm problem solving all night, and I can't go to sleep. And I'm like, you know, someone, I heard someone say this before. If you can't go to sleep, don't count the sheep. Talk to the shepherd. You know, that's a good idea. Lord, I'm stressed out about this, but I thank you that you got this thing for me. Lord, I just put my trust in you. Come to me, all those who are heavy, 
laid in, and I will give you rest. Let's go back to that scripture verse again. I'll give you rest. He says he'll give you rest, but he can't. He says those who are carrying heavy burdens. Now listen to this next one, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you. Now first of all, when I was growing up, I didn't know what yoke was. I thought they were talking about eggs. I really did. I'm like, I broke my yoke this morning with a piece of toast. I mean, I understand. What's this yoke? Well, what is yoke? We know what a yoke is. I'll explain to you, to those of you who don't know what a yoke is. A yoke is something that you, you hits in the middle of the egg. It's yellow. No. What a yoke is this. A yoke is when you had cattle back in that time, in the antiquity, and even today in some farming villages, where they, if you go to like the Pennsylvania Dutch country, they still have the yoke and they still have the cattle. A yoke is like a collar you'd put on. And that yoke is something you'd pull a, you'd pull a plow or whatever you pull a, a cart, whatever it would be, and you'd put that yoke upon you and you'd have to carry that thing and push. And so what they would do often is they would yoke a couple of different animals together, some mules, some horses, you name it. And they would yoke them together. And the Bible says do not be unequally yoked because a farmer understands if you have a weaker animal, the yoke is wrong, you're not going to be able to do the work that's there. Instead of being a help in, in plowing, it will be a hindrance instead. It will be a weight instead of a help. And so Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and heavy, verse 28, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn, I go, what does that mean? Take my yoke upon you. You see, what happens is this. We often think, okay, what I need to do is just give it all to God. Lord Jesus, I let go and I let God. You're sitting there, Lord, I, I pray you'd, I, for those of you that are maybe single or going, Lord, I pray you send me a spouse, Lord. Send me my wife or a husband. Please, Lord God. And all you do is you sit in your room all day long and say, God, bring me my, no, you got to go out in faith. Or you're saying, God, help me get a job. Lord, help me get a job. Well, how do you get a job? You don't just sit there. You got to do something. Like somebody told me, there's two things that have happened with this church that people have said to me, you know, that haven't been here in a while. They said, wow, pastor, you did an amazing job in the church. You, I said, no, 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 it wasn't all me. It was God. It was God. God, you know, God helped it happen. And the people, we all got together and we did a great thing. And yeah, we're really excited about it. And then other people will come to me and say, wow, look what God did with the church. God gave you this. God, I said, no, God didn't do it. You should have seen it before God, before I came. It was a field. And they get kind of upset with me. It sounds kind of arrogant, but then I realized something. Do you realize God always works in partnership? It's God and us coming together. We often think it's all about us, doing all the work, or it's all God, I got nothing to do, just press the button, sit back, and let the remote robot God do it all for you. No, it's God and us working together. You know what God says? He says, I wish there was a man to stand in the gap for the people that I would have to bring in judgment. God says, be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. He says, go into all the world. He doesn't say, okay, guys, you're saved yet. Just have fun. You're taking vacation, and my angels will do all the work. No, it's always God's vision and us coming together. So we have this wrong idea, and I love the fact that Jesus doesn't say, come to me, those that are heavy laden, and throw all the worries on me, and, and let me handle it, and you're good now. It doesn't say that. What does it say? Verse 29, take my yoke upon you. So get rid of your yoke and go under Jesus' yoke. So Jesus doesn't want to, he doesn't want to say, okay, um, read the Bible, pray more, um, get filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, get in a small group, and, uh, and memorize scripture, and I'll see you later. He doesn't say that. He says, listen, I want you to get under the yoke. Take my yoke upon you. So Jesus is sitting there alongside of us. He wants to get down with us and get that thing around him. And you're looking at him. Now it's not you doing it. It's you and Jesus doing it together. So he's not calling us to do this all by ourselves. No, is he saying, no, Jesus, I'm not taking your yoke. Because that's legalism. You just do the work. No, get under here. Get under the yoke. I want to help you. I want to go with you. I want to help you get right. So Jesus is asking us to put his yoke and his burden. It's a burden, folks. It takes work. But how much better when Jesus is plowing with you? God, I don't know what to do with this wayward child. I'm at a loss, God, but I'm going to get under the yoke with you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to seek you first, God. And I'm going to go, Lord God, help me. Give me wisdom. Take your yoke upon you. I love this next part. Let me teach you. Because I'm humble and I'm gentle heart. And you'll find rest for your souls. 
let me teach you. He's not like here, get your rock together, get down. No, he's like, come over here. Let me take you. Listen, cast your care upon me. I'm here for you. Get under me. Now, let me teach you. Let me ask you a question. When you get taught something, how many are experts right away? I'm trying to teach my children this. You don't just like try out for the soccer team, and next thing you know, you're that crazy guy from South America that almost got arrested. What's his name? Messi. You're not messy overnight. People don't know what I'm talking about. That's all right. But you don't just start playing soccer, become an excellent. You don't just start become a financial planner, become a millionaire overnight, right? You don't just take, pick up a guitar for the first time and you're playing like Stevie Ray Vaughan or I'm dating myself. You, you, what you have to do is you got to practice, right? You got to learn, right? You don't just do it automatically. But Jesus says something so wonderful. He says, let me teach you. In other words, cut yourself some slack and stop the self-attack. Because what does he say here? Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle. I'm going to help work. We're going to work this out together. Don't beat yourself up. Imagine this. You know, imagine you're, you're trying to do something, and imagine if you're, imagine you're getting the groceries out of the car with your children. And you're picking up the groceries, and little Junior can't pick it up. He says, I'm so weak. What's wrong with me? He starts punching himself. I'm, I'm weak. I can't pick up the we, we, Stop it. Hey, come here. This is how you do it. Okay, use your legs. Put something light, and you'll teach your child how to pick up the groceries, right? Jesus is humble. He's gentle. He says, take my yoke. You don't have to worry about all this junk on you. Let it come upon me. Take my yoke upon you. I am humble and gentle of heart. And you'll find, it doesn't say you might find, you'll find rest for your souls. It's not what happens to you, it's what happens in you. And God wants to give you rest for your soul. You can be at rest. There's a young lady that is in our church and a number of years now, and she went through a major health crisis, major health crisis. Could have been her life. And I'd see her walk it through. And every time I, every time I saw her, she'd oh, it's doing fine. I mean, it's like I couldn't believe what she was going through, chemotherapy and all that, right? And I, I seen more people get anxious getting a pedicure than her going to get chemo treatments. It's just like unbelievable. She's like, oh, it's okay. God's got it. You know, he's going to take care of me. And she, and she, what she did, she got under the yoke, right? Jesus is with me. I'm going to submit myself to the doctor. I'm going to do everything I'm supposed to do. I'm going to pray. I'm going to believe God. And she had to rest for her soul. You see, God wants us to get to that place. You know, this the, what prompted me to talk about this today as the worship team gets ready in the next five minutes is... I was, uh, one morning I was having devotions and I was reading. Normally I get a, to a quiet place, but that day I made my cup of coffee, had it in the right hand side on my easy chair, and there's Matthew. I'm sitting there reading my Bible and I'm seeing Matthew on the floor playing with Legos. Just playing with Legos. He's so happy and content, didn't have a care in the world. Five years old, not a care in the world. Just happy walking around. Next thing you know, he comes up, he jumps on my, you know, my kids are very affectionate, I like that, but he comes up, he comes right next to me, I'm like, well, I gotta read my Bible. I said, wait, wait a minute, no, I'm gonna let him stay here. And I just, he's sitting there, just putting little Star Wars, whatever, the, the Legos together, sitting here, doing it right here, talking, I'm reading my Bible, and I looked at him, I said, why can't I be like him? He didn't have a care in the world. My son Matthew, he didn't have a care in the world. All he has to do is put Legos together, brush his teeth, put his toys away, and go to bed. I mean, that's it. And he's happy, walks around, happy. My, all my other kids are happy, too. But when you're five years old, there's something special about a five-year-old, right? I, I wish I could just stop it and leave them there. I just love five-year-olds because they, they can go to the bathroom on their own. They can eat on their own. They can sort of brush their teeth. You know, guys like five-year-olds. Women like babies. Babies, uh, okay. But five-year-olds? So, you know, he's sitting there. He's not, he has no worries at all. I'm saying, God, why can't I be like my son, Matthew? And God said, you can be. No, I can't. Yes, you can be. He's got no job, no mortgage, right? No health issues, no receding hairline. <laughs> Nothing like that, right? He's doing great. And he has no worries. Why? Because daddy has it under control and mommy have it under control. He has no worries. As long as he does what we say to him to do, he's in perfect peace. And God wants us to be like children. He doesn't want us to be childish and get upset all the time. You did that, you know, all that kind of mind. No, but he wants us to have the childish awe 
and wonder, my father's got it. I, he is not worrying about the mortgage when we go on vacation. He's not thinking about that we've spent all of our money and we're going to be on the street. He doesn't think about that. I'm, I'm okay, by the way. But he doesn't think about that. He didn't say, oh, he sees a toy. I want a toy. You know, we go into this Toys R Us, and he, I want that, that, that. And he walks around like he's Donald Trump. <laughs> God help us. He wants to buy the whole store. No, son, you can't have that. But he's, he's got joy. He's, he's, he's peaceful. And I'm like, God, why can't I be like that? And I felt the Lord said to me, you can be like that. And my friends, you can be like a child too. Know that your father's got it. doesn't mean you're lazy. doesn't mean you don't do anything. Come to me, all of you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my burden. Let me teach you, Jesus says. Let me teach you because I am humble, verse 29, in gentle heart. And you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. God wants to give you a burden that's light because he's with you. Now, how does it get lighter? How does it get better? How do we do that? Well, as we sum up, if you have burdens, come to Jesus. Come to me, all of you are heavy burden. Come to him first. Don't come to Christ at the end. After you went to 10 counselors and took 20 different medications and drank at six different bars, no, go to him first, okay? I'm not suggesting that doctors have their appropriate place, but go to him first. Come to me, all you are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And stop worrying about struggling. We all struggle. We all have trouble in this world, okay? In this world, you're going to have trouble. And Jesus even said, my soul's deeply troubled. He understands trouble. He understands anxiety. To cut yourself some slack. Stop the personal attack and say, God's going to help you learn to get through it. You're not going to be an expert overnight. And Jesus is there for you. First Peter 5, 7 says this, give all your worries and cares to God for he cares about you. And Jesus says, what what, what good is it to worry? Can you add one day to your life by worrying? He says, this is what you're supposed to do. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will do. So we have to come to him first. Come to him first. The second thing we have to do is yield to Jesus. He says, take my yoke. Okay? So we have to yield to him. Take off your yoke and put on his. And then he says, learn from me. God wants you to learn. Now, how do you learn from him? How do you grow? Well, let me, get, let me tell you something right here this morning. Uh, if you really want to see change happen in your life, can I just suggest a few things? Since you're here, you have no choice. The ushers have already locked the doors. So. And the worship team still hasn't come up yet. Okay. They're in rebellion. But anyhow. So what, what, do, I, what do I close with this? How do we really, really change? Well, Jesus says, come to me. Will you come to him? I want to encourage you to come to Jesus the first thing of your day. Now, I'm not saying you need to read 20 chapters in the Bible, but when, before you put your foot on the ground, how about this one? This would be a good one. How about before you go to Facebook, you go to God's face first? How about before, this is the hard one for me, before you read the news, before I turn my little phone on and see what's going on in the world, how about, you know, before I do that, Lord Jesus, I'm not saying it's long, just say, Lord Jesus, I give you this day, Lord, this day is not mine, it's yours. I dedicate this day to you while you're in bed, and when you put your feet on the floor, you give them the first part of your day. Now, I, I advise you give them the first part of your day and read and all that, but sometimes you're not good in the morning. But will you do that every day? Give God, seek God first in the day. Give him the first part of your day. The first thing, give it to him first. Dedicate your day. Number, number two, I want to encourage you to do is get into the Word of God. And I understand people say that all the time, what do I read? I've read Exodus, and they're talking about mother's milk and goats and... What the heck is that going to help me, man? Born, and then you fall asleep. Okay, do me a, okay, let me give you some advice. Start in the New Testament. And start with the book of Mark. It's nice and short, and it gets to the point. Mark is a book made for men. It gets to the point. Boom. Read Mark. Start in the gospel. Give yourself five minutes and just pray. Lord, open my eyes and underline what jumps out at you or highlight. Okay, do that. Get your first party day, read, and then pray what you just read. Pray what you just read. I mean, here I am sitting here, and God will give you every day. I tell you, there's, there's very few days I don't get something out of my word when I read it. Then pray, and then I want to encourage you to do a couple of things as well. Make it a habit to come to church where you have other believers. Jesus says, come to me, 
And guess what? Who it guess you guys are the body of Christ, right? So come to church. Make it a priority to get to church. Don't let everything else but church happen. Come to church. Make it a priority in your life. Make it a priority to read your word. Pray. Come to church. And then what? Get involved with other people. Find other men, men with men, women with women that are going after the same thing you're going after. Hang out with people that are going after the same thing you're going after. Find groups to hang out with. We got small groups in the fall. Small groups are nothing more than the catalyst to get you guys together so we can pray together. Who can ask you the hard questions? Who can you talk to when you're going through a difficult time? So come to church. Get involved with a small group. Serve someplace. Help someone else out. Today we have a serve class. You can find out how you can serve in the church. Give God the first of your day. Read, pray, get involved with other people that are Christians and serve. And I guarantee you, you do those things, I absolutely guarantee you, 12 months from now, you'll be a different person than you are right now. You'll commit yourself to these disciplines, not out of legalism, but out of opportunity. It's like saying, get a good night's sleep and eat good meals. Is that legalism? No, that's how you become healthy. I'm telling you, it works. Give it time. Be progressive about it and watch what God will do. Well, let's, uh, let's bow our heads and pray. Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden. My question to you today is this. Have you come to Jesus yet? I'm going to ask you if you come to church because obviously you're here. Or if you're watching live on stream. Have you come to Jesus? He says, come to me. doesn't say come to read the Bible. doesn't say come get involved with a small group. You just said all those things. Yes, I understand that. But the most important thing is to come to Jesus first. Have you come to Jesus? Not if you believe him, have you come to him? He says, come to me. All of you. Have you come to him? Do you realize that Jesus came and died for you? You don't have what it takes, but he does. The only way you're going to have the true help in your life is to finally give it all to him. And today is an opportunity. I'm going to give you an opportunity today. I try to do this every week. It's the most important thing you can do is to give your life to Christ. If you're getting tired of trying to do it on your own, say, Lord, I give it to you. Let's just pray right now and bow your heads. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for me, and you paid for all of my sins. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown, and I hand over my life to you. Thank you. I confess my sins. I thank you that I am now forgiven of every sin I've ever done. I give my life to you. Now give me the strength to walk the path before me. Lord, my life is now yours. It's not mine. In Jesus' name, with every head bowed, just don't know how to pray with you better. Say, Pastor, just quick show of hands. Say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer today. Anyone this morning say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer today? Say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer this morning. Anyone online as well? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for being honest this morning. And so I want to pray for the rest of everyone else here right now. We're going to pray. And let's pray that God would just touch our lives and, and transform our lives and that our burdens would be light. His yoke is easy. He's a good, good father. That's who he is. He wants to bless you. And so let's pray right now about that. I want to thank you so much that you're a good God. You're a good, good father. That's who you are, Lord. Lord, we want to bless you this morning. We want to trust you. We give our lives to you afresh in Jesus' name. Father, we recognize we have not put you first, and we want to put you first. Lord, we choose this day to put you first. Lord, we choose to take your burden, realize that you're calling us to work with you. Father, I know you're calling us to get close to you, to put you first in all that we do. And Father, I pray that today, as we walk out of here today, we make it a priority, Lord, every morning before we get out of bed and say, Lord, this day is yours, that we take five or ten minutes a day and read your word you've given us and start a new testament we pray we commit ourselves to come here weekly lord to be encouraged and we'd find other other believers and that we could grow with and that we'd serve to make a difference in jesus name can we all stand
I'm going to ask the prayer team to make their way up. If you want prayer for anything at all, I'm going to ask you to come up for prayer. Right after this, this last song, we're going to have our growth track as well. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I heard the tender mercies of a love in the dead of night. Yeah, you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. Good, good Father, to you I, to you I, to Lord, we thank you. We bless you today, God. We would ask that we'd walk out of here today, take your burden, that we'd be cast our cares upon you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to continue to let the front be open for prayer. If you need prayer for anything at all, we're going to dismiss this service, but we're not dismissing this time up front. Okay, everybody? God bless you.